be straightforward about what they're up to. I would be remiss in having you here if I did not ask you about a couple of electoral issues uh, that we have learned yep. about today. Um, in Arkansas today, incumbent Democratic Senator Blanche Lincoln learned that she is getting uh, a primary challenge from the state's Democratic Lieutenant Governor. Uh, we've also learned that Harold Ford will not be mounting a primary challenge against Kirsten Gillibrand in New York State. Uh, did the party at the national level weigh in on, on either of those decisions, and will you? Um, the, the answer is we have not weighed in on either of the decisions of, of Harold Ford or Lieutenant Governor Harder. Um, in Harold Ford's case, obviously, you know, a strong Democrat, I think with a great future in the Democratic Party. My sense is, you know, he went around and surveyed and found that while people felt strongly about him, uh, Senator Gillibrand had a very, very uh, dedicated uh, group of supporters within the state party. And, and uh, you know, I think he made the decision that discretion was the better part of valor in that instance. But I think he's going to continue to be a real strong voice within the Democratic Party. I just learned within the last couple hours about the situation in Arkansas and haven't really dug into that one very much. I do know that today at the White House, uh, um, uh, Robert Gibbs uh, talked about the president's uh, support for Senator Lincoln, uh, that she's worked closely with him. And, and, um, and you know, given that statement from the White House, I'm sure we're going to be taking the, the same tack. But that's one that I just learned about shortly before I came on the show. Prepare to hear from the left on, uh, on Blanche Lincoln, Mr. Chairman. Uh, they've, made their, they've made their feelings about this one known in a lot of fundraising uh, already today. It's going to be a real hot topic within the party. Uh, Chairman, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm so sure it will. I'm sure it will, um, Rachel. I just, you know, uh, one of the things I know, uh, having been a Democrat in Virginia, is, you know, not every state is like every other, and the definitions of left, right, and center, you know, kind of depend on who your electorate is. Chairman Tim Kaine of the Democratic National Committee, thank you very much for your time tonight, sir. Really appreciate it. Glad to be with you. Thanks. The magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake that shook Chile on Saturday was so powerful, it may have changed the way the Earth rotates on its axis and made the length of a day here on Earth shorter. Because the quake shifted hundreds of miles of rock, it actually changed the distribution of weight on the planet, which moves the axis around which the globe rotates. NASA geophysicist Richard Gross has told Bloomberg News today that, according to his calculations, the Earth's axis likely shifted by three inches because of the quake, and the length of the day should have gotten shorter by 1.26 microseconds. In Chile, the official death toll from the massive quake is now above 720. That number is expected to rise. Almost 2 million people's homes have been destroyed or rendered uninhabitable. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton is on a Latin American trip right now. She's due in Chile tomorrow. She will bring with her 20 satellite phones and a technician to set them up. USAID is also mobilizing a field hospital, communication, support, and water purification systems at the request of the Chilean government. If you would like to donate to relief efforts via your mobile phone, uh, here are a few options. You can text the word Chile to 25383 to donate $10 to Habitat for Humanity. Or you can send the word rebuild to 50555 to make a $10 donation to Operation USA. Or you can text Chile to 20222 to donate $10 to World Vision. We will have more ways that you can help posted on our website at rachel.msnbc.com. If you would like to donate to relief efforts via your mobile phone, uh, here are a few options. You can text the word Chile to 25383 to donate $10 to Habitat for Humanity. Or you can send the word rebuild to 50555 to make a $10 donation to Operation USA. Or you can text Chile to 20222 to donate $10 to World Vision. We will have more ways that you can help posted on our website at rachel.msnbc.com. Hey, remember all the shouting and stalling and screaming that was last August when suddenly health reform was a communist plot to kill your grandmother? When the idea of death panels was a thing the president of the United States had to debunk? Well, the summer of 2009 might be making a comeback because the highly organized, well-funded groups responsible for much of the insanity of last August are apparently becoming re-energized by the fact that health reform really looks like it's going to pass now. The Washington Post reporting on anti-health reform interest groups newly dispatching lobbyists and launching new ad campaigns in a last-ditch effort to fight reform. Americans for Prosperity, for example, tells the Post it bought $250,000 in TV ads last week and is planning more anti reform ads and rallies this month. The health insurance lobby group, AHIP, says that it's making a big effort to fight reform now. And a conservative organization called 60 Plus has announced a half million dollar ad campaign aimed at getting 18 conservative House Democrats to vote against reform. 
In case you don't remember who all these groups are from last time around, here's a refresher. Let's start with Americans for Prosperity. This group deserves lots of credit for the summer of the sweaty, screaming town hall meeting. They're the people who brought you the anti-health reform tour bus with the giant bloody handprint painted on the side. Their contribution to the political discourse includes um, this guy who spoke at a rally they co-sponsored in Pueblo, Colorado. If this new Obamacare program comes to fruition, when you reach 65 and every five years thereafter, you're going to have to have a counseling session with some, um, some federal uh, airhead. Part of this process is called end-of-life counseling, and part of the end-of-life counseling can be an end-of-life order. What does that mean? End of life. Another word for that is death. Order. What's another word for that? A sentence. Now, bear, you folks review with me a little bit. As I recall, Stalin in 1920 issued about 20 million end of life orders for his fellow Russians. Pol Pot did it uh, during the Vietnam War. He ended, issued about 2 million end of life orders orders. Adolf Hitler issued six million end-of-life orders. He called his program the final solution. I kind of wonder what we're going to call ours. The president of the group at whose event that man was speaking, uh, Americans for Prosperity, was a guest on this show twice last year. After his organization initially called that video a fraud and denied that that speech was given at one of their events, here's what Tim Phillips, the head of Americans for Prosperity, told me on this show about that speech and that kind of rhetoric. Having speakers at your event that. saying that Obamacare is like Pol Pot and, and, and I Holocaust. Haven't said that. Right, but your speakers have and your organizing. A speaker organizing who was at an event that was co sponsored by us, we right. do not control the podium. We, we do not control the podium. Not we denounce that kind of rhetoric, that's a bad idea, not it has no place at our events, but we do not control the podium at the events that we sponsor. Tim Phillips also refused during the course of his appearances on this show to disclose who his funders are. But he did use this show as a platform from which to solicit more corporate funding for his organization. We're happy to take corporate money. So if there's more corporations watching tonight, feel free to give to us. And okay. if you're watching tonight and want to give to us and your corporation, we would love to have more corporate funding. More anonymous corporate money with which to fight against health reform, please, and with which to say President Obama is Hitler. Uh, also, a little refresher on America's health insurance plans, or AHIP. This organization's motives are easy enough to identify. They are, of course, the health insurance lobby. But as a reminder, their anti-reform greatest hits include encouraging insurance industry employees to attend town hall meetings to oppose reform back in August, even sending out anti-public option August recess talking points for use at said town hall meetings. Also in October of last year, AHIP threatened via a widely debunked study to raise health insurance rates astronomically if health reform did pass. And by widely debunked, I mean the firm that conducted the study backed away from its own findings, saying that AHIP only wanted it to evaluate the parts of the health reform bill they didn't like. And of course, since health reform still hasn't passed, everybody's premiums are totally holding steady or going down right now, right? Isn't life awesome without health reform? Yeah. And then, of course, there's 60 Plus, the organization that bills itself as the conservative alternative to the AARP. For its part, the AARP exposed 60 Plus back in 2006 as a front group funded by the pharmaceutical industry to stop state-level health reforms that would cut into the drug industry's bottom line. The primary objective of the 60-plus literature that I picked up at CPAC seems to be to proudly embrace the group's ties to Americans for Prosperity. They, them, the bloody handprint on the bus people. If the renewed efforts of these groups uh, turn out to be anything like their last big anti-reform push, if March is anything like August, we are in for a long, nasty, corporate-funded month. Except maybe this time the media will ask harder questions about who these folks are and who funds them. Right? Maybe? Please? Who brought down Bernie Madoff? Bernie Madoff ran a fake business, a fake investment scheme. He told people he was shrewdly playing the market with their money, earning them a solid, never-changing 12% annual rate of return. So that meant you could double your money by investing with Bernie in six years. Sounds great, right? 
But in reality, Bernie Madoff wasn't trading or investing in anything. He was just taking people's money and using it to pay off other investors. It was a Ponzi scheme, a $65 billion Ponzi scheme that unraveled in December 2008, about a month after the presidential election. Here's the thing, though. Who brought Bernie Madoff down? Who exposed him? Who caught him and got him arrested? No one did. Madoff turned himself in when his Ponzi scheme collapsed on its own. Ponzi schemes need a constant supply of new money to keep them going. When the economy had a stroke at the end of Bush's second term, there wasn't enough new money to, or, or around.